Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Liz Chatterton, and I'm the brand ambassador at Kegworks, and uh, we're going to give a little talk on the science of draft beer dispensing. My name's Tom McManus, and I'm the chief executive officer of Kegworks and one of the owners. Uh, let me start off by telling you just a little bit about Kegworks, uh, if you're not familiar with who we are. Kegworks is in Kenmore, New York. We're a 15-year-old company. We were founded on April 1st, 1998. That was intentional. My partner started this as a joke. Uh, 15 <laughs> years later, uh, there's almost 50 of us now. So we've been growing like crazy. Um, what we sell is we sell everything you find in a bar except the alcohol. This is a picture of our warehouse. We have 7,000 products, 5,000 of which ship from Kenmore, New York. Our product lines include draft beer dispensing equipment, bar tools and accessories, premium cocktail ingredients such as bitters and high-end tonic waters, bar foot rails, we're the largest distributor of bar foot rails in the country, so if you're in a bar and you put your feet on that rail, chances are if it's been built recently, it came from us. We also sell refrigeration and bar furniture. Our customers are anyone that serves alcohol. So from our best customer, who is a, a person that has a bar in their basement, to your neighborhood tavern, all the way up to a casino in Las Vegas. Our customers span the full range. So anyone that serves alcohol is a customer of ours. Now what we're very excited about is that we just opened up our first retail location. Thank you, whoever made that noise. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> We're very proud of it. It's 4,000 square feet of tools for drinking. Yeah. So we're <laughs> <laughs> I love when the audience has been drinking for a long time before we start talking. <laughs> this is fantastic. I love it. it takes the edge off. Slant you. <laughs> um, so whether you're a beer person, a cocktail person, a wine person, we have stuff for you. I guarantee it'll be your new favorite store. Please come see us. We're on Kenmore. We're in Kenmore on Military Road behind Kenmore Mercy Hospital. It's the old Mr. Seconds. <laughs> Looks just like it. <laughs> now, one thing we take very seriously at Kegworks is our training. Um, a majority of our staff is draft beer certified. Okay, so your beer system, your beer system breaks. Our staff can, I've seen it happen. I saw it happen at the hockey game last week and a beer tap froze up. One of my guys jumped behind the counter and fixed the system. Um, we take that very seriously. So a lot of our staff is draft beer trained. Um, we have beer judges on staff, all that. Now, you're at a beer festival, you're seeing all these people. Keep in mind, you don't know who you're talking to because, that's a feedback, because the person on stage right now who's the beer judge and the certified beer train, or your technician isn't me. It's her. Okay? So, <laughs> so keep that in mind. You don't know who you're talking to. Okay. All right. So, beer. Um, it's what we do. It's what we do best. Uh, we're very good at drinking it, but dispensing it is the thing that we focus on. Um, there's a lot of science involved in beer, as hopefully you're learning tonight. There's chemistry, there's uh, biology, and there's plenty of physics. Um, <laughs> this is a picture I wanted to share with you because it's absolutely disgusting. Um, these are draft beer lines. Draft beer lines are supposed to be clear. Um, this is what happens when you don't clean them. Uh, we recommend you clean your beer lines after every keg. These actually came from a customer that hadn't cleaned their beer lines in quite some time. And uh, what happens is you get bacteria buildup and calcium deposits that form in the lines, and that'll ruin the flavor of your beer. As beer's flowing through that, it's going to get off flavors. It's pretty gross. Um, so that's not even in the beer, and that's science. Um, and we're gonna go through a little bit of history here first because it wasn't always this scientific, uh, the dispensing of draft beer. These are some clay pots that were found in what's now known as Iran from about 7,000 years ago. And uh, they found, they were able to do chemical tests and found that they did hold beer at one point. So we know that uh, about 7,000 years ago, beer was just stored in clay pots. There were no vortex bottles, no uh, you know, color changing mountains, just clay pots. 
Then we upgraded about 6,000 years ago to big communal bowls where they suck the beer out of reed straws. Um, this is a replication of an image that was found on a Mesopotamian tablet um, from about 6,000 years ago. And in more recent history, we have places like the Blue Monk, where you can choose from 30 different taps. Your beer is served from pressurized kegs at the perfect temperature, and it's in glasses that help the nucleation of your bubbles go perfectly. So how did we get from there to here? Science, <laughs> right? That's why we're here with the Science Museum. Now, the first major advancement was when our ancestors discovered that they can inject carbonation into their beer. Now, they did that by sealing the cask that they were making the beer in. Now, by sealing the cask, the yeast continu continued to ferment, ferment. Now, this fermentation resulted in the carbonation. Now, this carbonation, this discovery, led to the most important discovery we feel in the last 10,000 years, the discovery of the keg. Okay. More important than penicillin, more important than putting a man on the moon, more important than Al Gore inventing the internet. <laughs> we can now have beer in kegs. Now, they weren't always these beautiful stainless steel vessels that we see beer shipping in right now. They were made from oak or whatever non-porous, non-toxic hardwood was available at that time. Now, medieval monks in Europe, um, they started making beer and kegging it for the supply at their monasteries. They wanted to be able to uh, have some backups. And uh, the thing was, the beer didn't last very long, but they kept making it and kegging it anyway. And when the general population found out how good the beer was and how much they were making it, they uh, wanted to buy it. So these monks made a very wise business decision and they started to sell it. And the thing about selling beer is that you need some way to do that, right? And it wasn't just beer that they were selling. Um, priests were actually paid in beer to bless the brewing of each batch of beer. So if you're going to pay someone in beer, you need some kind of unit to do it. So they started to come up with some standard units of measurement. Uh, two of them that are still used today are barrel and firkin. Um, firkin is a type of cask. Barrel is what you refer to as, you know, the, the normal stainless steel kegs you see are actually a half keg, it's half a barrel. So the term barrel refers to a full keg, and those are actually still used today. So fast forward, the next major advancement is the invention, invention or excuse me, putting beer in bottles. Now the problem with putting beer in bottles at that time was that it was very expensive. It was very labor intensive. We didn't have giant factories cr cranking out the amount of glass and cans that we have right now. And so the only the wealthy could afford to drink bottled beer. Now what happened was this was the start of the drink local movement because the masses were still drinking beer from their local breweries. It wasn't because it was a community event. It was because it's what you had to do. That was the only place you could get the beer was from your local brewery. Now, speaking of communities, there's this common misconception that beer was just flowing down the streets of colonial America. And that was actually not true. Um, there were really high import taxes that made it hard to get the ingredients they needed, and there were shortages on what they could grow here. So it wasn't, you know, it is beer soaked as some people think during the uh, early colonial days here in America. But there were some wealthy citizens that were able to brew beer. <laughs> uh, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and my friend Sam Adams there. Um, they all started brewing beer, and it was those wealthy people that were able to start uh, small commercial scale breweries in cities like Philadelphia, Boston, and New York. And those breweries were still using the same kind of wooden casks with wooden taps like these. And it doesn't sound very scientific, but you've got the wooden wooden keg and you've got a tap like this, you pull the end out and uh, you tip it and the beer comes out, which is a science we like to refer to as gravity. And Anyone know who this guy is? Come on, nobody? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> This is Joseph Brown. Joseph. 
This is going to turn <laughs> sideways on me quick. Um, Joseph Brahm invented the beer engine. The beer engine was the first mechanical method for dispensing beer. The way it worked is it used hydraulics to pull beer through the tube by pumping that lever on the top. Now, this is important for another reason, because this introduced the first uh, major step in temperature control. Because you didn't need direct access to the beer, you, it was flowing through the tube, you could store the beer either under the bar or in the basement where it was cooler, and colder beer was better at that time. Okay? When beer is cold, or changes in temperature, I should say, result in changes in carbonation. And we'll talk a lot more about what happens in changes in carbonation in a few minutes. Uh, moving along in history, we got to the uh, early 19th century, and there was a lot of industrialization and innovation in brewing. And that was really good because the breweries were able to make more beer to uh, keep the millions of thirsty immigrants that were flooding the country hydrated. And uh, this is actually when really cold, really bubbly lagers became really popular, um, which Americans are still teased about a lot today um, because these people were working hard, they were thirsty, and uh, cold, bubbly lagers seemed to hit the spot. Um, so they were, uh, you know, making all of these cold lagers, which were great in bottles and cans, but it was a little bit problematic if you wanted to serve a cold bubbly lager on draft at that point. So now at that time, these, these beers were still being served using the engines, resulting in foamy beer. Now there have been massive, great steps forward in temperature control through the use of new refrigeration and new icebox technology but the beer was, there needed to be a better way to get the beer out of the tap. Now, the next major step forward was using compressed air to push the beer out the keg. Now, the problem with compressed air is it's most, mostly oxygen. Now, oxygen's fantastic for breathing, but it's lousy for beer. So, around the same time, uh, pasteurization also became pretty common in brewing. And uh, I'll give you a little brush up on your uh, grade school science. Pasteurization is when you heat a food, usually a liquid, in this case beer, very, very rapidly, and then you cool it very, very rapidly. And uh, that helps slow the growth of bacteria. And so they were actually using it in brewing long before they were using it for dairy, which uh, it's nice to know that uh, they have their priorities in order. But. Now, any type of pasteurization, whether it's beer or milk, is progress. Now, a lot of times what follows progress is a crisis. Now, I'd like a moment of silence in remembrance of the 18th Amendment. <laughs> Thank you. Fast forward 13 <laughs> years later. 21st Amendment's passed. Everything's back, to, everything's back to normal. We're back to brewing beer. Now the problem is this pasteurization concept is being used on all beers. Now pasteurization is great for bottled beer, canned beer, but they're also pasteurizing uh, keg beer. Now combination of that pasteurization of keg beer with the bad, um, bad dispensing technology that they were using resulted was in a lot of bad beer being poured. Now the appeal of draft beer is the freshness. When you do all these things to it, it loses that. So draft beer sales begin to plummet in this country. So uh, yeah, pasteurization ended up becoming a problem, even though it was initially a good thing. And uh, bottled and canned beer sales were uh, much higher than keg beer. And then in the, uh, about 1939 in the UK, uh, artificial uh, carbonation was introduced. And that was a great invention, but we weren't as connected back then and it was uh, pretty slow to take off. So it wasn't actually until about 1970 that all of the draft beer started being carbonated uh, here in the United States. And as they say, the rest is history. Uh, we're standing up here surrounded by a museum full of beautiful stainless steel kegs filled with uh, forced carbonation and you know, great glassware. and. Tons of advancements in technology. And uh, 
think we're going to hop into a, out of the history and into a little bit of anatomy. Now, this is what your draft beer system looks like when it's dissected. We start with the carbon dioxide, the CO2 tank. Now, this is either carbon dioxide or nitrogen or a blend of the two gases. The gas is then pushed through the regulator, and the regulator sets the pressure at which the gas is being pushed into the keg coupler. Now, the keg coupler is the device or the piece of equipment that sits on top of the keg. And the CO2 goes through the keg coupler into the keg. It then pushes the beer out through the beer line on the top, through the shank, and then through the faucet into your glass. So what's the biggest problem in getting beer from your glass, or from the tap into your glass? Foam, right? Foam. Money. <laughs> Money is a problem sometimes. Um, but no, foam. You get a bad pour, and it's usually because it's full of foam instead of beer. And uh, little known fact, does anyone know why the head of a beer, the foam, is white when the rest of the beer is brown or amber? Anyone? Okay, I'll tell you. So it's actually, um, foam is made up of a bunch of tiny little bubbles all put together. And those bubbles are little um, spheres of gas that are surrounded by a really thin wall of beer. And when the light hits it, it goes, it's refracted in a million different directions. And uh, that, that light, when it leaves the foam and hits your eyes, it's going in so many different ways, it ends up showing up to us as white instead of brown. <laughs> the rock star brewer. Um, now let's talk about that. Every beer is supposed to have a little bit of head on it. But if you're getting a half a glass, a full glass, that's too much. So what could be causing that problem? A couple different things. Your pressure is too high, or your pressure is too low. Your temperature, your beer temperature is too warm, or your beer temperature is too low. Dirty beer lines. Liz showed us a disgusting example of what dirty beer lines look like. Uh, the CO2 could be leaking, or you got a bad bartender. But <laughs> we know that never happens. So now, a key to what's causing the issues with your beer, if it's coming out too foamy, are the bubbles. Now, if the bubbles are large, look like soap bubbles, then chances are your pressure is too low or you're out of CO2. Now, if the beer comes out with lots of small bubbles, too foamy, number one, your beer temperature is either too high, your pressure is set too high, or you're hitting a warm spot in the uh, line. I think you have a story about a warm spot. Thank you. <laughs> so every year, it's a rite of passage at Kegworks. How we know it's fall is the college kids go back to college. And every year, it never fails. A fraternity, usually an engineering fraternity, decides that they want to put kegs in the basement and beer taps in every room. <laughs> Love the initiative. Um, but you can't keep the beer in the line cold. And that's the problem for these guys. It's, it's heartbreaking to tell them they can't do this. Well, they could do it, but I'm, these guys usually don't have $20,000 to invest in a glycol system or anything like that. <laughs> with enough money, we can do anything. Yeah, with enough money, anything can be done. <laughs> so another thing that frat boys should keep their eyes on are, uh, is their glassware. Um, has anyone ever had a glass like this where there's a ton of little tiny bubbles stuck to the side? That means you're drinking out of a dirty glass. Um, if you have a, a clean glass, all of the bubbles should rise from the center up to the top. And when they're sticking to the side like that, it means you've got a greasy film on the side of the glass. So that could be from a bad dish detergent, no dish detergent, leftover lipstick, um, all kinds of different things. But uh, if you have a beer like that, um, probably want to uh, get a cleaner glass. Now we've talked about foam, we've talked about bubbles, but what we're really talking about is CO2. Now what CO2 does is it comes into the, it comes into the keg 
It pushes the beer out. It also replaces that space inside the keg. Okay, it keeps that keg at a consistent pressure. Now that CO2 that stays inside the keg is kept at that same pressure as set by your regulator. Now, it's kind of like your thermostat. You know, you set your thermostat to a certain temperature, it's the middle of January, you open up the windows, and um, your, th your furnace kicks on, the pressure is returned. Now what happens is, a beer keg is really just like a big beer, I mean, well, humor me, <laughs> make it a point, I don't, don't, no judgment on the prop. So now, what happens is, We're gonna agitate the carbon dioxide out of this lovely mass-produced American crap. Okay, we'll say that. <laughs> we make no judgments, we'll talk about that later. So, what's gonna happen if that pressure is set too high is that that CO2 is gonna get absorbed into the liquid. You want, I need a volunteer. Can somebody open this for me? Sure, we're going to aim it towards you. No takers, huh? Um, so in addition to uh, maintaining the right amount of pressure inside of the keg, um, it also keeps the other beer that's left in the keg fresh. And uh, does anyone know how long a beer keg will stay fresh after it's tapped if you're using CO2? One semester. <laughs> <laughs> Close. It's actually about 30 to 45 days that a keg will stay fresh. Um, refrigerated. It's got to stay cold. Why is it lasting that long? Because there's CO2 that's being uh, returned to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it never lasts that long at our office, but that's what we've heard. It, it does supposedly last that long. So, uh, has anyone ever used one of these, a hand pump? Yeah. These actually use oxygen, and like Tom mentioned before, um, oxygen's really good for breathing, not so good for beer. So if you're going to use one of these, you should be entirely prepared to kick that entire keg within 24 hours, or oxidation will start to take place, and your beer is going to taste really bad. So if you're going to kick an entire keg in a day, does anyone know how much that is? It's, uh, depends on the type of keg you have. So half keg is 15 and a half gallons, 1,984 ounces, or about 165 bottles. Quarter keg, the one in the middle, the shorter, fatter ones that you see floating around, those are a uh, little under eight gallons, about 82 bottles. And then there's cylinders, which um, we like to get in the office because you can get two beers on tap and one kegerator um, and you know have a variety. But a, a six dull, as they're called, they have five gallons, or about 54 bottles worth. So we're going to do some more math. Tom has a little story. Okay. <laughs> All right, now I know you guys have been drinking, but we're going to do a little math. Now one of the most common questions we get at Kegworks is with people considering buying a kegerator, how long is this keg going to last? Well, before I got married, I was putting a kegerator into my apartment, and I was trying to figure out differently how much beer would I have to drink a day in order for me to drink this keg by myself before it goes bad. Four days. Now this is the kegerator in my house now. <laughs> so I have. A keg right now is 1,984 19, ounces divided by 35 days, okay, let's say five weeks for example's sake, that's 56 ounces per day. Now judging by some of you people in here, I'm going to guess that wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> but what that is, is that's three and, a half, three and a half pints a day. Now that's also making the big assumption on 100% keg yield, but we won't get into that right now. So three and a half pints a day. Um, <laughs> what, I f what I found is the first couple of days are fine. It's the days you miss 
and the catching up's a bitch. <laughs> so what I have also found, uh, much to my wife's dismay, uh, a kegerator is a fantastic way to get your friends together so we can get through this beer. <laughs> uh. So Tom mentioned having a draft system at home, and we kind of talked about how draft beer has made a comeback since the 1970s. All of these uh, scientific inventions and innovations have helped us serve better beer. And now you can get draft just about anywhere. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this, but you can go to Sunoco A+, when you're filling up your gas tank, and get a growler of fresh, arrogant bastard if you want. Um, and if you ask me, that's pretty awesome. So, one of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm out is a poorly poured beer. Anyone else agree with me on that? Okay. This is Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget did a study on humans' inability to distinguish identical volumes in different size vessels. So what he was saying was that the, gla the thin glass looks like it has more alcohol, or alcohol is just the way I think, has more liquid based on the height of the, height of the, height of the vessel versus the short glass that has the same amount. Now this is why, unless you have a very skilled bartender doing the count, you should order a drink in a rocks glass, not a tall glass. A drink poured in a rocks glass is usually going to be stronger because the bartender's perception on the amount of volume into the glass. <laughs> exactly. Now, where this comes into play is your beer glass. Now, what most people don't realize is the first half an inch of your beer glass contains 13% of the volume of that glass. The first inch contains 25% of the volume of a pint glass. So when you get that crappy pour, you're getting hosed on like 25% of your beer, if not more. Now the UK has this right. The UK says you can send that back, it's a law. <laughs> you tell the guy to tighten up the collar, he legally has to tighten up the collar. They specify how much beer can be in that glass. Here, we actually have this gauge where you can put on, put on the side of your glass and you can see how much beer you're getting hosed on. What I found by informing your friendly bartender that he doesn't know how to pour a beer and you'd like him to fix it, it's the fastest way to get human DNA into your next beer. So I would <laughs> recommend not doing that, but be aware. So we've talked a little bit about where we've come from and uh, where we are now. And I guess the next thing is where we're going. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this, but there's actually a company right here in Buffalo. They're called Niagara Dispensing. And they have engineered a uh, portable draft system. They have some at uh, First Niagara Center. That's what it's called now, right? Um, and they can pour a perfect 20-ounce beer in three seconds. Now, I'm not sure where we're going to go from there, but we are uh, definitely going to try more beer, more innovation. And uh, we have one last little message for you, um, and that's drink what you like. Um, it's not exactly scientific, but it's important. We consider ourselves beer enthusiasts, not beer snobs. To me, beer is like music. There are so many styles, there are so many different varieties, and we're all not gonna like everything. One is not better than the other, whether you're a dogfish head, you're a Russian river, or you're a Coors Light guy. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Drink what you like. Thank you very much. <laughs>